welcome to the First Day in Me Church Manassas broadcast, where the Holy Spirit empowers us to come together in the spirit of unity, ready to work and willing to serve. Our pastor, Reverend Etoria V. Goggins, and the entire Fame family are so excited that you are with us right now for another dynamic preached word of God. First A and me of Manassas, why would you stop the work? You may ask, what work? I'm talking about kingdom work, because the work of the kingdom can never stop. With sound biblical teaching, prayer, and spiritual impartation, we know that souls will be saved, lives changed, relationships restored, and the community will be empowered by the power that works in us. So once again, welcome to the First Day in New Church Manassas broadcast. Be blessed. Thank and praise God for how the men have ministered to us. Lord, have mercy. Is anybody determined this morning to go all the way? Hallelujah. Amen. We ask that you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? 
So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Amen. We ask your prayers on this sermonic thought, the making of a champion. The making of a champion. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent and how mighty is your name in all the earth. God, we thank you now for this day. Lord, we ask now that you would speak a word in this house that will lift and elevate your people. Speak a word that will strengthen somebody today, God. Speak a word, Lord, that may need to convict somebody and cut somebody to the core. But God, we thank you that even as your word cuts, it also serves as a healing balm. So God, we pray that you would just have your way in this house. Do what you want to do. Give us ears, spiritual ears, to hear what the Spirit is saying, Lord. And then once we have heard you speak, then let us not leave this place, God, not having determined in our hearts that we're going to act on what we have heard. Strengthen us, God, and we shall be strengthened. Keep us, and we shall be kept. Bless now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The making of a champion. Over the past week, many of us have been engaged in watching the documentaries on the renowned heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali. Ali was indeed a fascinating and charismatic figure and deemed the greatest boxer of all time. He was a compelling figure, tall, handsome, fast, and graceful in the ring. He was a star known for his quick wit. He was a jive-talking showman who had reporters eating out of the very palms of his hands. Ali was a humanitarian and gave cause to his countrymen to reflect on their nation and their place in the world. Muhammad Ali has always been more than a great boxer and more than a superb athlete. He took what he had and made the world a better place. He indeed was a champion. And when I talk about a champion, when I think about a champion, I'm talking about courageous men and women who achieved great things in the face of great obstacles and challenges. Champions do not become champions when they win the event, but they become champions in the hours, weeks, months, and years they spend preparing for it. The victorious performance is merely the demonstration of their championship character. Everybody loves a champion. Champions are not born, but champions are made. A champion is a winner of the first prize or the first place in a competition, one who does battle for another's rights or honor, one who shows marked superiority. Champions can be found in all walks of life. There are champion businessmen and businesswomen. There are champion athletes and champions of equal rights. There are champions for the homeless and champions for the rights for the unborn. There are even champions for animal rights. Lord, have mercy. Champions are countless and they have countless causes. Champions excel because they persevere. They go above and beyond the ordinary to achieve the extraordinary. We all know of people who put forth great effort to achieve their goals, but we also know people who put forth very little effort, minimum exertion, and achieve very little. Those persons rarely make it to the finish line because they don't get off the starting block. For many of them, this is because the thought of losing outweighs the training, the preparation, and the responsibility that comes with a champion. Lord, have mercy. And yet, the truth of the matter is, is that every, there is a champion in everybody. Some merely choose to make the effort that is necessary to pull the champion in them out of them. 
Beloved, I need to let you know that each one of us in here is given many chances to quit before we even reach the finish line or to slack off, Lord have mercy, once we have achieved a certain level of success. In every area of, uh, of endeavor, from the White House to the church house uh, to the schoolhouse, men and women who desire to attain or to achieve sometimes will allow themselves to be defeated because they become discouraged or disgraced by some dis misdeed or some indiscretion. Then there are those who make it through life without any blemishes on their character and integrity and rise to the status of a champion. What separates these people from champions is that champions are undaunted by seemingly impossible situations, not because they don't fail from time to time, but because champions don't quit. There's a champion in you because you have potential. Potential is something that exists in you that is possible, that is imaginable, that is attainable and capable of developing into actuality. We can be better than we are and we can do better than what we are doing. And one of the worst things you can do is not tap the potential that is in you and at least try to fulfill the potential that God has placed inside of you. It is a waste of God's gift to never fulfill what he has called you to do and what he has called you to be. I've come to tell somebody this morning that there is a gold mine hidden in every life, but you've got to dig to get to it. You've got to be willing to dig deep and to go beyond how you feel or what is convenient. But what stands in the way of you and your potential? What stands in the space between potential and manifestation? It is the very thing that we don't like. It is the thing that we often run from, yet it is the thing that will help us to unleash our potential. What is that thing that we all need but we don't want? What is that thing that we constantly run from? What is that thing that we shake a fist at and say, leave me alone? What is the one thing that would make us more responsible, make us more reliable, and perhaps even self-motivate? it. I call it the D word. Keep your mind on Jesus. The D word is discipline. Discipline stands in the space between potential and manifestation of that potential. All of us have potential, but we are not willing to wait. We are not willing to focus and persevere. We are not willing to determine to work hard at developing the potential that is within us. We have a lot of wishbone, but we don't have much backbone. This ain't your shouting sermon today, so just, just listen, Lord, have mercy. Discipline is correction or regulation of oneself for the sake of improvement. Discipline is controlled behavior. Discipline is a method to obtain obedience or punishment intended to correct or to train. It is one of the most important features in any life, especially the Christian life. Unless we discipline our minds, minds, our mouths, our emotions, and our bodies, we will never achieve the success that rightfully belongs to us. Our focus for discipline is the correction or regulation of yourself for the sake of improvement. Discipline is the capacity for keeping your words, for keeping your emotions, and keeping your actions under control. That's what discipline is is having self-control, having self-restraint, restrained exercise of your impulses, emotions, and desires. Temperance is another word which is moderation in actions, thoughts, and feelings. It is a habit of moderation in appetites and passions. Self-control requires great strength because one of the hardest things for people to do is to say no to themselves. Self-control means doing what you must do and what needs to be done without delay. 
all too often we put off doing things because we don't have the D word. We don't have discipline. We put off taking action and we put off making decisions because we feel we can always do it later and later comes, but then there's more to do. I know I ain't going to get no help in here. Discipline is a way for us to become responsible, reliable, and self-motivated. We need discipline in every aspect of our lives. Why? Because a life without discipline is a life that is out of control. And we live in a day and in a time where most people, if not all people, are completely out of control. Children and adults can't control their tongues. It will take nothing for somebody to pull out a gun or a knife on you. Parents fight with other parents at school, events with children, and the parents are supposed to be the example. Our habits are out of control. Our children are out of control. Your eating is out of control. Your drinking is out of control. Your sexual appetites are out of control. Your spending and your debt are out of control. Why there's no restraint. People have little concern for the way they dress, what they watch, where they go, and what they do. Even church folk are out of control. Gossiping, out of control. Attitude, out of control. Can't take correction because you want to do what you want to do it when you want to do it. Out of control. Come in here praising God, but get out on the parking lot and get on the phone and cuss everybody out. Out of control. And each one of us in here, I know we sitting here looking cute uh, and we looking fine, uh, but God said everybody in this house uh, has at least one area uh, that you are out of control, uh, at least one area uh, that is hard to control. Uh, I know you looking fine, uh, but God's got your number. Why are we out of control? Because we don't have any discipline. No self-restraint. No regulation for the sake of improvement. And so the theme of our text today speaks to this matter of discipline. Paul is saying that you are in a race that everybody runs to win. Everybody runs to get the prize. Everybody who competes. Everybody who strives. Everybody who agonizes. Everybody who disciplines him or herself with respect to thinking, eating, drinking, sleeping, and obeying the rules goes into strict training. And I need to let you know that this training is not easy. It is painful. It is exhausting. But we've got to persevere. Paul's argument is that the Christian life is a race. And so every Christian, like the Greek athlete, must discipline himself or herself so that they might be successful. The Greek athlete of the day had to subject themselves to rigorous discipline for 10 months. They had to take an oath saying that they would comply with the rules. They had to give up everything that would hinder them from running the race and winning the race. The athletes had to practice discipline and that's why God is calling us to this 10 day fast. He didn't say 10 months because God knew all of us in here couldn't handle a 10 month fast. So God just said, give me 10 days. Can you turn your plate down for 10 days? Can you go through some strict training for 10 days? Can you read your Bible for 10 days? Can you pray for 10 days? Can you get... I have respect for any athlete 
especially Olympian athletes, because of the unbelievable amount of personal discipline and self-control that they have to practice daily for years. When athletes are often interviewed, the person will talk about the fact that they have to train every day, sometimes eight to ten hours a day, for at least three years. They know what it takes. They know the competition that they are up against, but they have to perform vigorous physical exercises and increasingly difficult routines. Every day, they have to endure a special diet to enhance their strength and their vitality. They have to stay away, Lord have mercy, from junk food. You got to stay away from junk food all the time. Every night, they have to make sure that they get adequate rest for their body, their mind, and their spirit. They have to abstain from any vice that might deplete the body's well-being. They could not engage in any activity that might sidetrack them or get them off focus from their goal. Everything is centered on making them ready to run the race. Everything is centered on them to get ready to win. And so the personal need for, for, for self-control and discipline is a necessity for the Christian race. There is always something in life and, and something in this world that will distract you and get you off course from training as a champion of God. There are temptations that will cause us to turn aside. There are temptations that will want to make us give up. There are temptations. Lord, have mercy because we want to do what we want to do. But surrendering to those temptations will sabotage your Christian effectiveness in reaching the prize. And that's what Paul is talking about. He says that we've got to have self-discipline. We need self-control. It is one of the necessities of the Christian life. It is a fruit of the Spirit. We need discipline and we need self-control because we don't have somebody imposing control on us. We don't have anybody telling us what we have to do to live the Christian life. We don't have anybody forcing on us how to live our walk with God. And what I mean is that you don't have anybody to tell you how many hours a day to read your Bible. You don't have anybody standing over you telling you or making you attend church school every Sunday. You don't have anybody standing over you telling you how many hours a week you ought to pray. You don't have anybody standing over you telling you that you need to go out and evangelize the loss. You don't have anybody standing over you telling you what you ought to give in church. Well, God tells us what to give, but some of us are not even disciplined enough to do that. We don't have anybody controlling us and telling us what to watch on TV, what to listen to on the radio, or listening to a certain kind of music. We don't have anybody telling us you need to go see the sick, you need to go see the lonely, or telling me that I need to get out from these four walls. There is only one thing that will keep you doing all of that stuff and the strength to do all of that stuff, and that's the D word, discipline, because it takes a whole lot of character to have self-discipline to do something on your own than it does to be told what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Only the disciplined will ever get good at anything. And so the Christian life is no different. Lord, have mercy. The church is filled with people who love to be Christians with the tremendous knowledge of God's word, but they are not willing to pay the price to act on the word. We are fat Christians, P-H-A-T, uh-huh, fat Christians. We like getting fat off the word of God. Come in every Sunday, I need a word, I need a word. But God wants to know, what are you doing with the word that you got? What did you do with the word you got? Last yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. You forgot the word last Sunday. And the Sunday. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. In verse 26, 
Paul says, therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. This was Paul's personal testimony concerning his own life. He was running and fighting with his eyes focused on the goal. Every stride and every step has purpose. Every blow counts. Lord, have mercy. Paul understood that the greatest problem, his greatest problem, came from his bodily desires because his body wanted to go contrary to the desires of his mind and his spirit. Lord, have mercy. An undisciplined person is governed by their body and not their mind. Why? Because their body tells them what to do and the mind complies. The undisciplined person has no power over their desires. You get an urge and you smoke. You get an urge and you fulfill your lustly flesh. Lord, have mercy. But Paul said that we've got to be masters over our body and make our body a slave to the mind. And so here Paul says, I beat my body and make it a slave. And so he forced his body to do what his mind will to do in obedience to God and the scriptures. Paul exercised discipline over his body. And so this does not mean that he literally beat his body. But what Paul is saying is that he refused to be led by the desires of his flesh. He refuses to be led by the desires of his body. So I'm sure in the morning when his body said, keep on sleeping, when the alarm clock goes off, Paul would have the discipline to say, no, I've got to get up. When his body would say, keep on sleeping, his body, his mind would say, no, you got to get up and exercise. Paul made his body obey his mind and when his body would say a third helping Lord have mercy he would say in his mind no I don't need that because I've already had three helpings of macaroni and cheese I've come to tell you there will always be something to distract you in life there will always be hurdles to get over there will always be temptations to overcome but you've got to remember that there is no temptation that comes into your life where God won't make a way of escape. God will show you the way out with every temptation. And Paul says we need self-discipline. We need self-control because only the disciplined person will get good at everything. Everybody in life has to be disciplined. And I know it's a hard thing, but God said You've got to be disciplined. You've got to be on a regiment. You've got to give up some things so that I can show you how to get to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And I'm so glad that even though Muhammad Ali was considered the champion, he had many triumphs, but yet he had many tragedies. And I'm so glad even though he's the champion and they call him the greatest, He's not the greatest of the greatest. Hallelujah. Because Jesus is a champion of all champions. He ran the race. He focused on his attention. He focused his attention on the prize that was the salvation of humankind for the glory of God. Jesus never detoured from the purpose that was laid out for him. He stayed on the course. He crossed the finish line. And now now he's in heaven championing you before God the Father. Jesus is the ultimate example of what it takes to be a winner. Jesus is the example of what it takes to be a champion. The making of a champion is simply discipline. Discipline. Discipline in your life. Amen, amen, amen. That's all the time we have for today's broadcast. And we pray that you have truly been blessed. First AME Church Manassas is located at 10313 South Grand Avenue in Manassas, Virginia. And we encourage you to come by and visit at any time. 
Thursday night Bible study starts at 7 p.m. Sunday mornings at 8.30, we have church school classes for all age groups, and our dynamic worship service starts at 10 a.m. For more information, call 703-361-8791 or just visit us on the web at famechurch.com. Be blessed. Be blessed.